somebody besides David Reed tell me what today is? And Chuck, Chuck, you can't tell either. Chuck. Chuck. Oh, how about today, Scott? Scott and Andrew. <laughs> somebody tell me what today is. Besides Sunday. <laughs> yes, that is true. <laughs> Somebody tell me. Jewish feast day. Okay, you you got a whole bunch of Jewish feast days. You got to narrow it down, Herman. No, that was last week. You're close. Tabernacles. All right. Uh, David, read. Would you, since you had it open, would you you read John one fourteen? Go back to it. That's all right. Word was made flesh and That's right. So happy birthday, Jesus. More likely than not, if you want to narrow a day down, that's Jesus' birthday. We all know it's not December 25th. Uh, they don't have sheep in the field in the middle of December in Israel. They never did. It's too cold. Uh, the ends were never full. So automatically we know that Jesus had to have been born at a time when there was way too many people in Jerusalem. And there's only three times a year that that happened. And that was Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Those are the three feasts that are mandated. Did you bump my screen, Hobby? That's all right. We've got to get my line done. There we go. Those are the three feast days that were mandated according to the Torah, the law, that all Jewish Jewish males of certain age had to be there to present themselves. It was a mandatory formation. So, Feast of Tabernacles. Well, Feast of Tabernacles actually begins today. Today. Um, and actually, this is, I, I, once again, I got sidetracked. So, so let's get, get that. It starts today at 1030. So before we are out of this class, the Feast of Tabernacles will begin. Because it starts at 630 p.m. Israel, Jewish time, Jerusalem time. Because that's when sundown is over there. So the sun is about, is about 40 or 30 minutes from setting in Israel right now. And that will begin the Feast of Tabernacles. And so, Feast of Tabernacles is, I believe, probably the day that Jesus will fulfill both comings. He fulfilled his first coming on the Feast of Tabernacles. And there are other reasons why we know this. Uh, we, we talked about it briefly a couple of weeks ago. We, we know that Zechariah was of the course of Abijah. And we know what courses, looking through Josephus and, and some of these other scholars, we know what courses were in the tabernacle when the Jew, uh, when the, the, the temple fell to the Romans. And we know that these courses were every, they went every two weeks. And they were like clockwork, and there were 24 of them. And so it's a simple matter, and they were very strict about this. They did not mess this up. So it was... It's a simple matter of counting backwards. Okay, 24 two-week cycles. That we can get to when was Zechariah, who was the course of Abijah, in the temple. And by the way, this is a once in a this is an amazing thing about God. It's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. When you are of a course of priesthood and you are chosen by lottery to go in and offer the incense. That happened every day. But literally, there were 10, 8 to 10,000 people in each of these courses. Y'all know what I'm talking about, the courses, right? If you don't, you got to get some, you, you can't ignore the book of Deuteronomy. You can't ignore the book of Leviticus and Numbers. You just can't. The, all, of those, the, all of these things, like I said, uh, verbal plenary inspiration. It's a big theological term. Verbal plenary inspiration, it means every word in there is inspired by God and every word is important. Even the numbering of the tribes is important, as, we, as we'll look at later, not today. Even those numbers that seem like they're insignificant, they actually mean something. And you, if, once you figure that out, it's mind-blowing. 
Uh, and that'll be a tidbit. But we know from the course of Abijah that Zechariah was in the course of Abijah. So 14 of these guys every two years would be chosen to go in and offer incense. If you have 8,000 of you and you got 14 every two years, you know, over the course of your life, that's maybe seven, 800 chances. And that's assuming somebody doesn't accidentally get picked twice. So you had a 1 in 10 to 1 in 15 shot of actually being able to go in and offer the, sacri the, the, the incense, daily incense, over the course of your entire life. And God let that lot fall on Zechariah when he went in there and the Holy Spirit, the angel, said, your wife is going to have a child. Mm -hmm. He's going to be John the Baptist. And so we know when he was conceived, John the Baptist conceived, and we know how that Jesus was six months later. And doing all of the math, we come up to that it was sometime in September, depending on the year, between September 20th and September 23rd. <coughs> of, um, so it's right around now. But remember, the Hebrew calendar doesn't work like the English calendar. Uh, you know, the 29th of Elul, which is the last day of the Shemitah year, was the 13th of September this year. You know, next year it'll be the 20th of September or something like that. It, it, because there's only 360 days, and every five or six years they'll add another month to get everything squared, kind of like a leap year. So that's how that works. So that's the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, Jesus came, and, and the, I think John is doing a word play there. In first John, in John 1 14. He says he came and tabernacled, that's the Greek word. He came and tabernacled among us. Any remember what I said? Well, actually, I can't do I can't tell that. I'll, I'll tell that in a second. Every word is important, and you gotta know the context of it here. Alright, I wanted to look at something real quick. We've talked about building events. And there's a real interesting thing going on right now that I thought really illustrated what a building event is. So, building event. We know Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38 and 39, everybody's familiar with that. Most of you are familiar with Gog and Magog. Uh, we know that's a confederation, an Islamic confederation, probably with Russia and probably, and certainly with Iran. And it involves Syria and it involves a whole bunch of other Islamic countries. Well, what's interesting about this is how, how do you get to a point where Russia is so intimately involved with these Islamic nations that they're willing to go to war with Israel over it? We, we know that that's a fact, that that's what's going to happen, Ezekiel 30 and 39 says. So what a building event is, is remember what I said, that you do not arrive at the destination. This is not Star Trek. There are no teleporters. You don't just instantly arrive at a destination. All these prophecies that are in the Bible, one world government, one world currency, uh, mark of the beast, all of these things, uh, God may God war, the Psalm 83 war that we'll talk about a little later, all of these things are the destination. We don't just all of a sudden show up there. There has to be certain geopolitical events that set these things up. So to me, this is one of these, a good example of what I'm talking about. So... How do we get to God may God with Russia hand in hand with Syria and Iran to attack Israel? How do we get to that? So let's look at the roadmap. Well, in 2003, we invade Iraq. In 2009, we change the president and our foreign policy changes. We are no longer hands on in the Middle East. We have gone out of our way to say, you guys are great, and, you know, we're, we're terrible. In 2011, the troops left Iraq. 2011, 2012, the rise of ISIS. 2013, ISIS is in Syria. Now, on the flip change, there's, there's, there's a couple of legs to this. There's a couple of geopolitical events going on separately that are leading to the same destination. In 2009, we have a change in the president. We just talked about that when that was over here. The Arab Spring started. 
in 2010. In 2011, we led an invasion of Libya, one of the most idiotic things, and I'll be very honest, things that we had, I couldn't believe it, that we were doing this. It showed extreme nearsightedness because the very same thing has happened to Libya that they were criticizing Iraq for. You take away, a, you create a power vacuum and it's mayhem. You have no idea how many people are being killed in Libya right now because of the civil war that we started, which was, like I said, the same thing was criticized. It's parallel. We're doing the same thing that we criticized the other guy for. So the Arab Spring spread in Libya, and then, uh, and that should, I'm sorry, it spread, Arab Spring spread in Syria, not Libya, Syria. So they started their own civil war. Well, ISIS becomes the primary opposition. Before it was some moderate Muslims wanting to, to overthrow Bashar Assad. But then ISIS moved in and is now the primary opposition in Syria. And now, as of today, Russia has a base in Syria. Russia has, in the last couple of weeks, put in all sorts of anti-aircraft weaponry. Now, as far as I know, ISIS is not flying aircraft. So why do we need anti-aircraft help? Think about it. Um, they have a base there now. They have troops. Anybody know who was there last week? Yes. I know you do. Who, who, who visited Bashar al-Assad last week? No, not the Pope. No. Putin. Putin was there. So, we still have, we still have some road to go. But I want you to see what I'm, when I say building events, what I'm talking about. There's, this doesn't just happen in a vacuum. We don't wake up one day and go, wow, uh, Russia all of a sudden is with Syria and Iran. No. There's a succession of geopolitical stepping stones that get us there. Okay? And you got all this stuff in Damascus. <laughs> and we're going to talk about Isaiah 17.1, which is Damascus shall, Damascus shall be a ruin in the seat. Yes, sir. Rosa my life where the word of God says, I'm going to put hooks, hooks in your, in your jaw. jaw. That's right. And, and we're going to talk. You to come down. That's right. They're going to not have a choice. We're going to talk about Ezekiel 38 and 39 probably within the next month and a half. Uh, maybe a month away, a month and a half. i still got to lay out some things uh, depending on how long it takes us to get through the rapture. And only leave but a third of them. And only leave a third. Oh, well, yeah. Six. A sixth part of these. Yes, sir. Uh, that's only the, yeah, they're going to come down with a million, a million man army, and, you know, less than a couple hundred thousand will make it. That's just relate. I mean, I don't know how many it will be, but only a sixth of them will make it out alive. The rest of them will be slain. And we'll look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, and we'll try to figure out where it is. Because you've got all sorts of possible placements for God may God. It could be. Some people are put it as far as three and a half years before the beginning of the tribulation period for certain reasons, and we'll look at that. Some people put it at the beginning. Some people put it at the end of the tribulation, uh, that that is part of the Battle of Armageddon. And yet some people even say that the Ezekiel 38 and 39 is what is found in the end of Revelation. And we will see why that's not the case, but there, I just, I'll put that out there for you guys. So, back in Israel in the corner, they're going to make a well, let's wait for that when we get there, because that's that's a there's a lot of interesting things, any different different routes that we can take to get to that destination. All right, so real quick review: uh, pre-trib, pre-wrath, mid-trib, and post-trib rapture. Okay, there's the timeline. That's what we're looking at. Uh, we got a seven-year tribulation. We got a great tribulation right here. The start of it, that's the sixth seal. And there are three different views about when the rapture could be. And remember last week we spent the majority of the time debunking the post-trib view and showing you why that can't be the case. I will talk about that a little bit today, and then we will start on these other views. So rapture, why we cannot be post-trib. Why it just can't be. 
So it's quick review. Problem one, you can't, can you do simple math? Because Daniel is very specific that there's 1,290 days from the time the abomination of desolation takes place till the end, till the coming. There's 1,290 days. We also see uh, uh, 1,260 days all throughout, 42 months, three and a half years. We see all of these. If you can do simple math and you know when the abomination of desolation happened, which you're going to know, if you're here, you will know the day of the second coming, which debunks no man will know the day or the hour. So you can't, it's not an unknown day. He can't come as a thief if you can count to 1260 and do math and cross out things on a calendar. It's just, you can't do it. The second thing is the population problem. If it's a yo-yo, and remember what we said about yo-yo, rapture immediately come and heal. Rapture up, come back down. If it's this, then we have a problem with population. Who populates the millennial kingdom? If everybody's in a glorified body and we come down immediately and all the dead, the spiritually dead are judged and they're the goats and they're cast out, you basically at this point, in this yo-yo rapture, you only have two groups of people. You have the lost and the people in glorified bodies. There is no one there, as we saw in Isaiah, there's no one there to populate the thousand-year kingdom. And we know for a fact from reading Isaiah and other scriptures that we have flesh, human beings living in the thousand-year reign of Christ. Where do they come from? Because if it's a yo-yo rapture, then they're all either glorified or sent to hell. So you have a population problem. We have a Noah and Lot problem. Jesus himself says in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, that, it's, that the coming of the Son of Man, and this is where he's cryptic, because does he mean his coming for the bride or his coming for judgment, his second coming? He's got to be talking about the rapture there. And the reason why is because he says, in the day, it's, like, it's going to be like it was in Noah and Lot's day. They're eating and drinking and having a good time, and then all of a sudden, boom, here I come. Well, I don't know if you've actually done your homework and read the book of Revelation, but ain't nobody having a good time in the last three and a half years. They ain't giving in marriage, having parties, and just going about life as usual, which was what was going on in Noah's day and Lot's day. They were just, before the brimstone fell in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, there were people at the market. There were people getting married. You know, there were people doing commerce. There were people hoeing the field. And then it came, all of a sudden. In, in Noah's day, they were sitting out there until the rain started, which had never rained before. They were sitting out there making fun of Noah, going about their business. Everybody in the whole world was going about their business. If you've read the book of Revelation, you know that that is not what's happening. So that, that's a problem. We had a Jewish problem. Daniel 9 says, 70 weeks are determined for thy people. We also read in Romans 11 that the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Uh, we read in Revelation 7, we have 144,000 Jewish evangelists. God has given the Jewish nation another period of seven years. And they can't have it if the church is here. And finally, the restrainer problem. And we'll talk more about that. 2 Thessalonians 2 that the revealing of the Antichrist cannot occur. In other words, he can't even declare himself God in the temple until the restrainer is taken out. And the speculation is probably a good speculation that that's the Holy Spirit that dwells within the believer. So that's what we talked about last week. So this week, I want to talk about John 14, 1 through 3, and we're going to talk about Matthew 25. So simple. Let your... Hearts not be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. Would I not have told you, basically? If, if this wasn't so, would I have said this? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. That's John 14, 1 through 3. And we know what John 14, 6 says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus says in Matthew 7, he's the narrow gate. You know, in other words, all these people talking about Jesus, that Jesus is the way, well, that implies that there's big wide gates everywhere. And Jesus says, no, there's one narrow gate. That's it. And I'm the narrow gate. So, 
There's three interpretations of this passage of Scripture. One is that it's talking about at the time of the believer's death. Okay? That Jesus physically comes when you die or I die and takes us back to his father's house. He prepared a place for us and that happens at, his father, at, at our death. The second one is that it's talking about the rapture. <clears throat> and the third one is a conglomeration of the two that it's a double fulfillment. And actually this is where I fall in that it's actually a double fulfillment. But we'll explain why, first of all, and this is what this day is about, why it just cannot be number one. There's no way that it's just this. Absolutely not, and we will sh I will show you why. All right? It definitely is this. It's definitely the rapture. But it's possible that it could be both. And I think it probably is both, but I can't prove it. But what I can prove it is that. With beyond a shadow of a doubt. Okay, there's always a shadow of a doubt. But when I show you what's cool about what Jesus is saying, and that leads me to this. Let's review. Best way to study. If I really want to get what Jesus is saying in John 14, what, what three things do I have to do? There's three things. Research it. Am I reading research it? In the original language. Okay, I got to know what the original language is saying if I want to be absolutely certain what's being said, including the grammatical syntax and all of that. And remember, we have tools. You do not have to go to seminary anymore. Right now, seminary classes that, that get you into the Greek, they should have a basic introductory to Greek and how to use the resources. Because Greek is so complex that unless you devote your entire time Years and years and years of study, it is so intricate. It is best just to say, you know what? Vis, he's a good guy. He knows what he's doing. Strong knew what he was doing. It's best to do that instead of me trying to figure it out on my own. I went through a period of time where I was trying to do that, and I realized, you know what? There's so many little subtle differences that one little accent mark changes it. And you've got to know, I mean, how many rules would you think there are? Uh, thousands? In six weeks, thousand. I'd probably learn 50. Yeah. Uh, not even six weeks, five weeks. Yeah, and that's his yeah. introductory class. Yeah. <clears throat> the best thing I did with all my Greek seminary instruction was forget it. And rely on people who had devoted their entire lives, that was their calling by God, to, to study the Greek language. Because unless that's what you do, you're not going to know. I mean, it's just it's too complex. Okay, there's some really good resources out there. Uh, Thayer's is good. Um, I've got the well, Septuagint. That's the Hebrew. Um, Thayer's is a good um, resource. But I have a theological dictionary of the New Testament. Best thing I ever bought. It's ten books that take up about that much of my shelf. But it tells you the context of the word. It goes back into the ancient, you know, how was it used on the street in Greece? How did they use it in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament? How was it used in the New Testament? So it, it tells you all these things. And you can look up a word like agape and have 50 pages dedicated to it. So, okay, so that's one way. What's the next way? So you said it. Context. What did it mean to the original hearer? What did they think when they heard it? And finally, don't study the lens through your tradition. Don't study through the lens of your tradition. We get into a big trap when we do that. So, I want to talk about, good morning, I want to talk about uh, what did this mean to these hearers? Well, you cannot understand John 14 and Matthew 25 unless you know the details of the Jewish wedding. If you do not know what a traditional Jewish wedding looked like in the time of Jesus, you will never truly understand what is happening in Matthew 25. Remember Matthew 25 is there's ten virgins. Five are wise and five are foolish. Unless you know the details of the Jewish wedding and what's happening, there is no way, no how, you will figure that out. I promise you. That is the reason why you have to know the language, you have to know the context. Because otherwise, you're going to look at Matthew 25 and you're going to go, oh, that's real quaint. Okay, so we just got to be wise, right? 
No, there's a total subtext there that we miss if we do not know the Jewish wedding. In John 14, bless you. In, my, bless you, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Mm -hmm. And if I go, I go and prepare a place for you so that when I come again, I can receive you to myself. If you do not understand the Jewish wedding and have never even studied it, that does sound like, okay, when I die, Jesus is going to come and take me to his father's house. Once you know the Jewish wedding, which you will by the end of this class, you will go, oh, because you have to remember, who's listening to Jesus talking? Jews. Jews. Do you think they knew about the Jewish weddings? You think they were? Okay, they were clued in. So here's the Jewish wedding. The Kedushin. That's the selection of the bride, the betrothal process. That's where the fathers got together or even a, a son went to his father and said, hey, I like that woman over there. Why don't you go hook me up with her, daddy? Okay, and then you had the mohara. That was the arrangement of the redemption prize. Now, as you hear this, see if this doesn't sound a little bit like what's going on with us. So we have a selection of the bride. That's the betrothal process. Then we have the arrangement of the redemption price. In other words, how much do you want for her? You know, is it a couple of goats or do I have to give you half the herd? You know. Um, the ketubah, that's the offering of the marriage contract. The consent of the bride. The bride has to say yes in the Jewish custom. Now, most of the time the bride would say yes because daddy said you're going to say yes. But if the bride absolutely said, uh-uh, I ain't marrying him, he's, he's a goat, I don't know, he's ugly, or whatever. No. Then they drank from a cup that was sealing the engagement. Then the bride received gifts from the bridegroom. Now, bride and bridegroom, they're not married yet. You need to understand, but at the time of the betrothal, they're considered married. If that's the reason why jo uh, Joseph had to put Mary away. They, had, they weren't married yet. But they were betrothed to each other. That is the same in the Jewish eyes and God's eyes. People want to know when you're truly married. Is it when the preacher says, I do? Is it when you kiss? Is it when he signs the contract? No. In God's eyes, it's when you get engaged. That is in God's eyes when you are husband and wife. Because that was at the point in the Torah where it said, now you've got to issue her a writ of divorce. Even though technically you haven't done the marriage ceremony yet. So now, then there was the, the, the mikvot, which is the washing of the bride. They would ceremonially wash her, which was a cleansing. Now here's where it gets interesting. The bridegroom would, would leave. He would leave. He would leave her. He would go to his father's house and prepare a room. He would put on a little add-on, um, and that was called a kupa, and we'll, we'll see that. This kupa was a little add-on. In my father's house are many rooms. I go and prepare a place for you. It's the bridegroom going and preparing a place for the bride. The return of the bridegroom for the bride was at an unknown time, usually at night, and was preceded with a shout. With the voice, the shout of the archangel and the trump of God, First Thessalonians four sixteen, they would just they would be sitting. Maybe the bride, maybe the bridegroom, the, the the groom to be. Maybe he took his time. He wanted to build a really nice add on, and so it took him a while. And so the woman's like, the bride is like, when's he going to show back up? Why isn't he here? He's going to come, and it's usually in, at midnight. What they would do is they'd have a procession to the bride's house, and from afar off they would shout. They'd look out the window, and there they are. And then the procession back to the father's house. The bride is carried on a perian, which lifts her up. And the bride carries torches and oil lamps. Now, when we look at Matthew 25, you'll see how, how exactly, we know exactly what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 25. But I want you to understand that Jesus, when he said, I'll go and prepare a place for you at my father's house, every Jew that heard that went, well, I don't know what that is. That's the wedding. Okay? 
And when th and we look at the fulfillment of this, you'll see how it all worked out. The Nusian is the consummation. There's the kupa, the canopy or the closet. And I forgot to put this in there. Uh, how many days do you think they stayed in there? Seven. Seven. Yeah. So the bride was veiled. They would go back to the father's house. They would go into the kupa. And they'd stay there for seven days. That's where they would live. So, quote unquote. And then they would, after the seven days, they'd move into the house that he had prepared. But for seven days, they were there. And after the cons con uh, consummation that night, the groom would come out and say, marriage is consummated. Remember the story? Actually, you're probably going to hear about it today, I think, when Chuck's talking about Jacob. Okay? Remember he walked, he went in, and, and Laban had pulled the old switcheroo on him? Right. Okay? That's why he didn't know, because she was veiled. So that stuff that went on back in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob's time, that's the same stuff that was going on in Jesus' day. The bride was veiled, and it wasn't until the consummation. And then, after the seven-day consummation period, the couple joins the guests for the marriage supper. Okay? Marriage supper. So, the fulfillment. So we know Jesus is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. We know those scriptures. Remember when, when uh, the, Jesus was asked, why don't your disciples fast? You remember, anybody remember what he said? <clears throat> why he said that my disciples don't, aren't fasting now? What did he say? Right. He said, do the guests of the bridegroom fast during the wedding, basically? No. But they will fast when the bridegroom leaves. So Jesus is saying, I'm the bridegroom. Well, we know from Ephesians 5, the church is the bride. The guests are those who are in heaven, which are not part of the church age, the Old Testament saints uh, and people in the, in the tribulation period. Fulfillment. The caducian. That's the bride selected by the bridegroom. Remember Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. That's him selecting the bride. And there's other verses. Moher, the redemption price. We were bought with a price as a bride of Christ. What price was that? The blood of Christ. Christ on the cross. That's where he purchased us. He bought us. The ketubah, the marriage contract. Jesus said this is the marriage contract. This is the new covenant. Because see, in the Jewish language, the word covenant there... It could mean the covenant of the law, but it could also mean the bridal covenant. The covenant you make with husband and wife. They were equally as binding. The consent of the bride. Romans 10, 9 and 10. For if you, what? The Lord Jesus said, do what? Believe in your heart that God's raised from the dead, you shall be saved. This is where you consent to, through confession and belief. And then the drinking of the cup, the sealing of the engagement, and Jesus said, the cup is my shed blood. That's when the engagement was sealed. That's when we say, I do to the Lord, at that point, when we drink to that cup. The bride receives gifts from the bridegroom. What gift do you think we receive from Jesus? What gift? Okay, eternal life. Holy Spirit. In context of John 16, he says, if I go, I will send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to you. That is his gift to the bride, is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is our salvation. So they're kind of the same. So that's the Holy Spirit. Then walk, the washing of the bride. That's our sanctification. Remember, sanctification is a process. It's an instantaneous act, but it's also a process. You are declared righteous. You're justified at the point of salvation. But your, the actual act of cleaning you up is a process. When I go and catch big fish and small fish, hopefully big ones, they, when, I, when they come out of the water, they don't come out as fillets. All right? There's a process. And sometimes it ain't none too pretty to get a nice big fillet off of that fish. All right? It's a process. And so the washing of the bride is, the, is our sanctification. 
Now the bridegroom leaves. The bridegroom leaves to prepare a place for his bride. That was the ascension. That's when he left to go prepare a place. <clears throat> the condition, consecration of the bride. Again, that's the sanctification process. And the bridegroom is returned. That's the rapture. Now, here's the interesting thing. This is where we're going to get into the timings. It's an unknown time. They did not know. But anybody ever heard of Edersheim? Edersheim, and it's actually on Esor. It's one of these little books that you can download on Esor. Uh, the same, you can download Bibles, you can download graphics, you can download commentaries, and you can also download all of these books that are past their copyright dates that were maybe written back, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. You can, there's dozens of them. And one of them is Edersheim. And what Edersheim did is he wrote a book called Sketches of Jewish Social Life. So if you want to know why something is the way it was, greet each other with a holy kiss, you want to know those contexts of some of those things, Edersheim told you. And, and what he said was the tradition in Jesus' day was to have the wedding on a Wednesday. That meant the first three days of the week for the bride to prepare herself for the groom's coming. Now, I find that very interesting because remember when we talked about a pre-wrath rapture, which is around in the midpoint of the tribulation. So it's not seven, it's three, three and a half. Well, Edersheim says that that's kind of the way the marriage contract worked back then. If you got engaged, you'd get engaged on a Sunday officially, and then about Wednesday night, the groom would show up. So... He sometimes would show up on Wednesday, sometimes it would be at an unknown time. Like I said, it depends on how far his father's house was, really. I mean, if they were neighbors, yeah, you know, you don't have a whole lot of pilgrimage there. But sometimes with these Jewish contracts, they might have been 20, 30, 40 miles away. And, you know, that may be a two or three day walk. So, so the procession back to the father's house is the rapture. The Nashun is the consummation. Remember that? And that's the Kupa. That's where the couple stayed for seven days. That was a marriage consummation. So the marriage supper. Revelation 19.7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Why? Because we knew the bridegroom was coming back, but we didn't know the day or the hour. We didn't know exactly when. We kind of knew he wasn't going to take five years. We knew it might be next week. We were close. But what's interesting is the marriage supper of the Lamb happens before the second coming in the book of Revelation. Because immediately thereafter, John says in verses you know, 8, 9, or 10, he says, Then I saw. So there was a secession. There was a marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven, and then the second coming came. So if we, it's another thing, yet another thing that we want to talk about with the post trib rapture. Hold on, dude. Post trib rapture. If it's a yo-yo, you got a lot of things that have to take place in a short amount of time. Okay? And I think I actually have that, so I'll wait on it. So, in my father's house, let's review it. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I'd have told you, and I'd go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. There I am now, you may be also. So, now hearing that... And you're less, now that you've got the knowledge of a first century Jewish man or woman, what does that sound like to you? Okay? Because where else in Jewish society did the bridegroom, because Jesus had already identified himself as the bridegroom, remember? He'd already said, I'm the bridegroom to them. Okay? So they knew in context, when he says he's the bridegroom and he's leaving to go prepare a place in his father's house, that's a no-brainer for a Jew. They know exactly what you're talking about. All right? So, Matthew 25. Matthew 25. We've got ten virgins. Five wise and five foolish. Everybody know what? Have you done your homework? Matthew 25. Somebody open there, and if you can read the first 11 verses real quick. <coughs> Verse 11. Uh -huh. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. 
Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. Okay. And he said, nope, sorry. So, five foolish virgins have no oil. They have no filling of the Holy Spirit. Basically, because oil always in the, in the scriptures represents the Holy Spirit. Okay. So the, the bridegroom delayed. They were sleeping virgins. Then there was a midnight cry. They needed oil. The foolish had none. Wise virgins are taken to the wedding feast. The foolish virgins are left behind because they were not prepared. I say stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and stand before the Son of Man. Now, when we talk about the rapture of the church. Ah, I had my order out. No uh, post-trib rapture. Remember, also, uh, we had those five reasons, but I'm going to ask you two more while there's not a post-trib rapture. Now, knowing that God is eternal and God can do anything in a short amount of time and make it seem like long. But to me, it doesn't make sense that we go up and that we're there long enough to have the marriage feast of the Lamb and the Bema seat judgment. That we know that is when the judgment seat of Christ is. And then that we come down immediately. It doesn't seem like enough time to have all of those things, David. What I was going to say, what I've heard is after the marriage supper, the, the Jewish couple usually took a year off. It's, it's yeah. A, it's going to be a, a while. Yeah, a it was a while. Yeah, they, they would take a while in the honeymoon, basically, and, yeah, and just year. chill out mm -hmm. at the father's house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, pre wrath Is it possibly a pre wrath rapture? And we'll talk more about this next week. But the six seals, the beginning of God's wrath. And on Wednesday, remember, we said that, hey, Edersheim said that they would come on Wednesday in the middle of the week. And pre-wrath is in the middle of the week. It's in the middle of that seven-year period of tribulation. It's smack dab in the middle of it. And we think that is, that's when the abomination of desolations happens. That's when a lot of stuff happens that we'll talk about in the future. So it's possible that the rapture could actually be pre-wrath. Um, and that's where we said stay awake at all times. So the rapture of the church, could it be a partial rapture? Matthew 25 seems to indicate that it may be a partial rapture. Because remember, there were two groups, both of which were virgins. But some had their lamps filled, and some didn't. Now, the promise to Philadelphia is to be kept out of the trial. What's interesting is, is that there are five or four other churches that have good things said about them. They're not all bad. Remember, there's five total, uh, there, there's, there's three that have good and bad said about them, and then there's two that have only good, and then there's two that have only bad. So I've left out the two that are only bad. And these four churches had something good or all good about them. Okay, Smyrna was all good. But yet the promise to be kept out of a trial was not given to them. It was only given to the Church of Philadelphia. I find that interesting, and it's something we should probably explore at a later time. There were ten virgins. Five were taken to the marriage supper. Five were left behind. They're trying to find oil for their lamps. And then the doors of the wedding feast are shut. Okay. So, here's the thing. As we look next week, we're going to look a little bit more at reviewing what that pre-wrath rapture or a partial rapture looks like. A partial rapture could be this. God's got some standard of how we should be living.
Okay? Doesn't mean you're not saved. Again, Matthew 25. Were there five virgins and five whores? No. There were ten virgins. All of which were basically brides. That's the context. It wasn't her wedding party, the bride and her wedding party. Jesus is saying basically there's ten, ten brides to be. But five of them were foolish. Didn't mean there weren't brides. But it means that they were kept out of the wedding feast, the seven days. And they, they had gone to try it at the last second. They knew this was happening. At the last second, they were like, please, sorry, you didn't live a life that was full of oil. Is that the way it is? And that's what's going to happen? I don't know. That is called the, the partial rapture, is that part of the church will go through the tribulation. The church of Philadelphia will be kept out of the trial to come. But only the church. Ephesus doesn't get promised. Jesus has some really good things to say about Ephesus. He has some really good things to be said, said about Smyrna. Neither one of these guys are promised to escape trial to come. Only Philadelphia. Yeah. And that's why I think a lot of people in the church in this is that your life, how you live it, does matter. It does matter. There are there's going to be a separation between the tears. There's a lot more to that that never gets discussed in that. It is just washed over just want to say, oh, you say, just go on. Right. And I think your life does matter how you live it. And, and I'll be honest, that is one of the main criticisms for anybody that's in prophecy circles and David can tell you this. one of the main criticisms of people who ascribe to a post tribulation rapture view is that get out of jail free mentality in am I lying yeah that's that's why if you listen to anybody who teaches a post trib rapture they they get to the point of mocking people who are believing pre trib rapture because they, we have got this idea and this mindset, especially in America, that, oh, bad stuff's never going to happen to us. Oh, the Lord's going to come and take us all home. How many of you have heard that? They, oh, we can't, that's not going to happen to us. And they believe it creates, the post-trib rapture people believe it creates softness. Because you're not going to be prepared. And they believe that it creates a, a mentality of weakness in the believer because they just think they're gonna, they they got to get out of jail free card and they'll never experience any hardships. So that if hardships do happen, they lose their faith. How many people have you known when hard times hit them, they could be the most on fire person you might have ever seen. And then when hard times hit them, there's two ways that people go when hard times hit. They either get stronger in the Lord or they fall away. They rarely stay the same. And I have seen it over and over and over again. Because they had this mentality, well, God's supposed to be a God of goodness. Nothing bad ever happens to me. Obviously, they never read the book of Job. You know, Job constantly is arguing with his three buddies. I didn't do anything. You obviously did something because look what's happening to you. I didn't. I promise. No, no, you're a liar. And then God has to come in and set them all straight. And so if, if people are of the opinion that all my life's going to be roses, they've never read Job and don't understand what's going on. I don't think America is not going to go through while the rest of the world is being Yeah, exactly. Right now is going to be Exactly. Yeah, and so that's just some of the ideas here. And the pre-wrath idea is actually one that has, to me, has merit, except for the seven years. The seven days. And as we get into talking about why I'm 90, 95% pre trib rapture, we'll discuss all of those things. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we give you praise and I give you thanks. And Lord, we just uh, ask that you would go forward today and just uh, fill us with your spirit. Lord, we ask that you would just touch us today, minister to us, help us to worship in, in spirit and truth today. And Lord, we pray you'll anoint our pastor and give him your wisdom uh, as he leads us today. In Christ's name.